Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our annual Emanuel M. Rock Lecture at, here at the University of Richmond School of Law. This lecture series is an opportunity for us to hear from important le leaders in the legal, legal community and beyond, and to engage in conversations on some timely and important topics. The series was created by Mr. Emrock and his wife, Bertha, and continues to be supported by his son, Walter, and daughter-in-law, Karen, both of whom are with us today. Emmanuel Emrock was a 1931 graduate of Richmond Law, had a very distinguished career as a trial lawyer. He was founder and past president of the Richmond and Virginia Tri Trial Lawyers Association and a member of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers. But Mr. Emrock was much more than a terrific lawyer. He was founder of the Richmond chapter of the National Conference of Christians and Jews and was chair of the committee that successfully secured enactment of Virginia's anti-discrimination in advertising law, and it was an important step forward at that time. In 1974, he was honored by the NCCJ with that organization's humanitarian award. So we are very pleased to be continuing that outstanding legacy with this series here at the Law School. Today we're particularly grateful to have as our speaker Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Dean Chemerinsky was, is Dean and Jesse Choper Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. He started at, at uh, Berkeley quite recently, having ended his tenure as the founding dean of the UC Irvine School of Law. Before that, he taught at DePaul, at the University of Southern California, and at Duke Law School. Dean Chemerinsky is a renowned constitutional scholar uh, and lawyer. He's author of 10 books and, according to one count, over 200 law review articles. Mm -hmm. Some of his books include mm -hmm. The Case Against the Supreme Court, Closing the Courthouse Doors, How Your Constitutional Rights Became Unenforceable, and Free Speech on Campus. In addition, we learned at lunch today that many of our students know Dean Chemerinsky for his outstanding lectures with the Barbary series. <laughs> some, of them, some of you commented that you recognized his voice. Aww. Earlier this year, National Jurist Magazine named Dean Chemerinsky as the the most influential person in legal education in the United States. Today, Dean Chemerinsky joins us to discuss a particularly timely topic, free speech on campus. So please join me in welcoming Dean Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction and the very warm welcome. It's truly a pleasure to be with you. It's an enormous honor to be asked to deliver the Emanuel Enrock Lecture. Yesterday at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, at lunchtime, Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz spoke. The title of his topic was A Liberal Case for Israel. When it was announced that Professor Dershowitz was going to speak, Another student group, these are the Students for Justice for Palestinians, objected. I met with them. I said I would, of course, invite anyone who they wanted to come speak on the same terms that Professor Dershowitz was appearing. They came to see me on Tuesday afternoon, just day before yesterday, and they were concerned that Professor Dershowitz said he would only take written questions. They wanted to be able to speak to him orally and challenge him. I wrote to him Tuesday night and I said, I have a request from students that you receive oral questions as well as ones of writing. He agreed. He spoke yesterday between 12.30 and 2 without incident. He said seven students asked questions. Six of them were quite challenging and he engaged in a dialogue with them. I got an email from him after the event that he believed that it was constructive and educational. I got several emails from students also praising the event because of the dialogue that occurred. It felt great to me that we were able to model in that way what free speech should be about. Last night at about 6 o'clock, I was sitting in San Francisco airport waiting for a delayed flight, and I suddenly got several emails. Somebody had taken a flyer with Alan Dershowitz's picture and drew a swastika on it. 
and it was posted on a bullet board in a prominent place in the law school. This, of course, is just one of several incidents that have occurred on the Berkeley campus that raise issues about free speech, how it should be treated in the First Amendment. On Thursday, September 21st, the conservative commentator Ben Shapiro came to speak on campus. There were threats of violent activity, especially by the group Antifa. So the campus spent $600,000 on security to make sure that Ben Shapiro could speak, but also that the safety of students, staff, and faculty were protected. The university closed a key part of the street, Bancroft Avenue, that runs in front of the campus. It erected concrete barricades around several buildings. But it was successful. Ben Shapiro spoke. There was no violence. The conservative provocateur, Milo Yiannopoulos, had announced that the following week, beginning with the Sunday, September 24th, was going to be free speech on campus. He had said that he was going to speak every day from Sunday through Wednesday, twice a day, and that he invited Ann Coulter and Steve Bannon to come as well. Well, it turns out that Ann Coulter and Steve Bannon were never actually scheduled to speak. The inviting student group canceled the so-called free speech week. But Milo Yiannopoulos did appear on campus on that Sunday, talked for about 15 minutes, but it cost the campus hundreds of thousand dollars with regard to security. On Tuesday night, I heard the chancellor at University of California, Berkeley, Carol Chris say that so far, just this semester, the campus has spent over $2 million so as to provide security when there were expressions of free speech, such as the ones that I mentioned. All of this convinces me that the context of talking about free speech on campus is different today than it used to be. Our mental image of free speech on campus was also shaped by Berkeley. In the mid-1960s, there was the free speech movement on that campus. It was about students wanting to be able to engage in speech unrelated to university activities and campus administrators stopping them from doing so. Now, though, so often it's about outside speakers wanting to use the campus as a stage. People like Milo Yiannopoulos, Ben Shapiro, Ann Coulter. And often now, it's about outside groups, like Antifa, threatening or even engaging in violence to prevent the speech. The campus finds itself in the position, as Berkeley has, of needing to spend an enormous amount of money to protect speech and also to provide safety and security. There's other differences as well. I think that student attitudes towards speech somewhat changed. The year before last, I taught an undergraduate freshman seminar at the University of California, Irvine, with Chancellor Howard Gilman. We had 15 students in our class. They were all serious learners who engaged with material. We began each topic by posing a problem for our students based on a real-world event. We polled our students as to what they thought the court should do. For the very first class, the initial problem was a true story of an incident that occurred at the University of Oklahoma a year earlier in the spring of 2015. You might have read about it, maybe even you've seen the video on YouTube. It was a bus of members of a fraternity. The only people on the bus were fraternity members. They were all dressed in formal wear. Two members of the fraternity stood up and led the others in a chant. The chant was racist, deeply offensive, spoke of lynching in a positive way. Another member of the fraternity took a video of this, put it online, it quickly went viral. Immediately the president of the University of Oklahoma, David Bourne, expelled those students, students from school, and he suspended the fraternity from operating on campus. So the question that we asked our students was, if the expelled students had sued, claiming their First Amendment rights were violated, who should win? The expelled students in their First Amendment claim or the president of the University of Oklahoma? Fifteen to nothing, our students voted in favor of the president of the University of Oklahoma. 
Now, one student wanted to say, this is speech protected by the First Amendment. Now, had these two students sued, there's no doubt that they would have won in court. Their speech was protected by the First Amendment. In fact, the general counsel of the University of Oklahoma later said to me that they knew that if the students sued, that they would have lost in court, but the university still felt it had to take this action. Time and again, over the course of the quarter, our students came down solidly on the side of campus authority to restrict speech. Really, did we have students who wanted to defend freedom of speech? We taught the same class last year as an upper-level political science seminar. We saw much the same thing. Opinion polls confirm this. The Pew Research Institute did a study two years ago of college undergraduates, and 40% believed that offensive or racist speech on campus should be prohibited and should be punished by the college or university. In mid-September, the chancellor on my campus, Carol Christ, did a faculty panel in anticipation of the so-called Free Speech Week. And over and again, students in the audience and even faculty members said, the Chancellor Chris should simply refuse to invite anyone who she thinks is going to deliver a hateful message. And those who said that got large applause in the audience. Finally, near the end of the panel discussion, I said, let's be clear here. If Chancellor Christ were to deny Milo Yiannopoulos or Ben Shapiro the ability to come, they would sue. They would get an injunction. They would win. I pointed to the example of when Auburn University refused to allow white supremacist Richard Spencer to come to that campus. He sued. He got an injunction. He won. I said, the university was responsible for paying the attorney's fees for those who were excluded and asserting their First Amendment rights. Because it's violating clearly established law, Chancellor Chris might be responsible for paying money damages. Those she excludes will be presenting themselves then as martyrs and as victims, and nothing will be gained. They'll get to speak anyway. No one applauded when I said that. <laughs> There's been a lot of analysis in the press of why might it be that support for free speech among college students is waning. Some criticize this generation of college students for this attitude. I find it laudable. This is the first generation of students to grow up from a young age being taught that bullying is wrong. They've internalized that message. They want to create an inclusive learning environment for all within the school. Also, we have to remember that this is a generation of college students that hasn't had to deal with the suppression of speech nor have they seen the noble effects of free speech. The civil rights protests of the 1950s and the 1960s, the anti-war protests of the late 1960s and the early 1970s, is as long ago for today's college students as World War I is for Howard Gilman and me. I think there's another difference, too, that we have to account for. I think, for whatever reason, people are willing to express racist and anti-Semitic messages that rarely were conveyed in public. I've been a law professor now for 38 years. I've never taught in a law school building where somebody drew a swastika on the wall. I'm 64 years old. I've never seen in public someone hold up a sign. It existed at Charlottesville, and I quote you. It said, kikes belong in the oven. What is it that's changed in our political and social culture that lets people feel that they can draw swastikas on a wall at Berkeley Law School or hold up a sign like that? So this is the context for talking about free speech on campus. One of the things that I've discovered participating in these conversations is that people often ignore a crucial distinction between talking about what the law is with regard to free speech on campus and considering what the law should be. We certainly could have either of those conversations, but they're often quite different conversations. What I want to do more with you is talk about what the law is with regard to free speech on campus. What I also want to do is identify some of the places where the law is unclear but the law simply hasn't kept up with the reality of the situation. Because these are the things that we as law professors need to focus on, 
the law students and their notes need to address, and that as lawyers, we're going to need to litigate. And so let me summarize the current law in three major principles. The first is that all ideas and views can be expressed on a college campus, period. Under the First Amendment, there's no such thing as a false idea. Above all, the Supreme Court has said that freedom of speech means that the government can't censor or punish speech on the grounds that it's offensive, even very deeply offensive. A key illustration of this, a case from earlier this decade, Snyder versus Phelps. You might remember it because it got a lot of media attention, even if the name of the decision isn't familiar. It involves a small church out of Topeka, Kansas, the Westboro Baptist Church. They make it a practice of going to funerals those who died in military service. They use that as an occasion for expressing a very vile anti-gay, anti-lesbian message. Matthew Snyder died in military service as a Marine in Iraq. The members of the Westboro Baptist Church traveled to his funeral in the state of Maryland. Before the funeral, they asked police officers where they could lawfully stand. The officers pointed an area about a thousand feet away from the ceremony that was going to be held. Before the funeral, the members of the Westboro Baptist Church, led by Fred and Margie Phelps, chanted and sang. During the funeral, they were silent, but they held up signs. That night, Matthew's father, Albert Snyder, was watching the news. He saw footage where he could read those signs. He was deeply offended. He sued for intentional infliction of emotional distress and invasion of privacy. The jury awarded him $10 million in damages. But the United States Supreme Court, eight to one, ruled in favor of the members of the West Baptist Church and against Albert Snyder. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court, and he said that a bedrock principle of the First Amendment is that the government never can censor speech, punish speech, hold speech liable on the grounds that it's offensive. Now obviously here I'm speaking of public colleges and universities. As everyone in this room knows, the First Amendment and the Constitution's protection of rights only apply as to the government. This seems to me the least understood principle of constitutional law by the general public. Just day before yesterday, I got a call from a reporter at an NPR station saying that if the NFL and a football team fire a football player, release the player for not standing in the national anthem, doesn't that violate the First Amendment? My response was, the NFL, the NFL teams aren't the government. The First Amendment doesn't apply to them. And the reporter's response to me was, Professor, are you sure about that? <laughs> And the answer was, I'm sure. Now, of course, <laughs> there may be other sources of law that apply freedom of speech to private universities. In California, there's a statute called the Leonard Law that says that a private school cannot punish speech. It would violate the First Amendment for public law to punish that speech. That's a statute, but unique to California. Many colleges and universities have faculty and student handbooks that proclaim the protection of freedom of speech. A number of courts have held that those student and faculty handbooks constitute a contract that's judicially enforceable. So that's a different source of protection of speech. And of course, if we were talking about what should be, we could discuss how crucial freedom of speech is for academic freedom. That academic freedom is all about the advancement of ideas and knowledge. It can't occur without freedom of speech. We go back not that long ago in the scope of American history to the McCarthy era of the early 1940s, early 1940s and early 1950s. And talk about faculty members who lost their jobs just for being suspected of being communists, of students being expelled for that. And it would illustrate how crucial academic freedom is for public and private universities for the enterprise of advancing knowledge. The second principle in describing the current law 
is that there, freedom of speech is not absolute. There are categories of unprotected speech. The idea that freedom of speech is not absolute is familiar with everyone. We all know the famous words of Justice Olive Wendell Holmes, that there's no right to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. But at least since Szaplinski versus New Hampshire in 1942, the Supreme Court has said there's categories of speech that are unprotected by the First Amendment. That is, the government can punish and hold such speech liable. Obvious example, child pornography is speech that's not protected by the First Amendment. People can be punished even for private possession of child pornography. False and deceptive advertising is not speech protected by the First Amendment. In the context of what we're talking about today, free speech on campus, three types of unprotected speech are quite relevant. One is that incitement of illegal activity is speech unprotected by the First Amendment. But here, as we go to all of these categories, it's important to separate the colloquial use of the word from the legal test for the concept. The legal test for incitement comes from Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969, where the Supreme Court said that speech can be punished as incitement only if there is a substantial likelihood of imminent illegal activity, and only if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegal activity. So many said to me over the course of the last month, if a speaker like Milo Yiannopoulos comes onto campus, and we know that that might create a violent response, isn't that enough to be incitement? The answer is clearly no. The reaction of the audience can never be a basis for suppressing the speaker. If the reaction of the audience can silence the speaker, then there really is a heckler's veto, where any unpopular spe speaker is stopped just by saying there's going to be a violent audience reaction. If that were enough, then southern states could have stopped civil rights protesters by saying there's going to be an angry response to them. Their speech is really what's inciting it. They can be punished. And that, of course, can't be true. A second category of unprotected speech are so-called true threats. The Supreme Court has said if it's a true threat, it's speech not protected by the First Amendment. The phrase true threats comes from a Supreme Court case in the mid-1960s, United States versus Watts. It involves a federal law still on the books that makes it a crime to make a threat against the President of the United States. The Supreme Court upheld the statute, but said a distinction must be drawn between what it called true threats and mere hyperbole. Courts struggling still to define when is it a true threat? Is it enough that a reasonable person would imminently fear for his or her physical safety? Or does it have to be shown that the speaker desired to cause the recipient of the information to fear for his or her physical safety. This issue was before the Supreme Court just a couple years ago, and it wasn't resolved under the First Amendment. The case was Alanis versus the United States. You might remember this too, because it got a lot of media attention. It involved a man by the name of Anthony Douglas Alanis. He was through a very bitter divorce. His wife, Tara, was given custody of their two children. He then began posting Facebook messages, and they were clearly indicating a desire that he would do harm to her. In fact, he went beyond just her. At one point, he posted on Facebook that he was going to go to a kindergarten class and commit an act of unprecedented violence. It was just a question of which kindergarten class. For doing this, he was convicted of making threats in interstate commerce. The jury was instructed that it could find him guilty but found that a reasonable person would imminently fear for his or her physical safety. The United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit affirmed the conviction. But the United States Supreme Court reversed in an eight to one decision. Chief Justice Roberts for the court. He focused just on the statute. And he said in order to be a threat in interstate commerce, it has to be shown that the speaker desired to cause the person to fear for his or her physical safety. It's not enough that the reasonable person would fear for his or her physical safety. And the court left the First Amendment issue unresolved. The circuits and the states are split. 
I think the Supreme Court got it wrong. They got it wrong in terms of the statute. I think it's wrong in terms of the First Amendment. I agree with those courts that have said there's no First Amendment right to use speech in a way that would cause people to reasonably fear for imminent harm to their physical safety. Imagine that there's a student walking across campus. For purpose of my hypothetical, make it a student of color. Imagine an angry group surrounds that student and yells at that student in a way that makes that student fear, reasonably, that there's going to be harm to physical safety. I don't think it matters what that group of students actually had in mind, whether they wanted to or planned to cause violence. If it reasonably causes somebody to fear, I don't think it should be protected. But this is one of those areas where the law is just not settled. A third category of unprotected speech is harassment. It's interesting that there's relatively few cases dealing with what constitutes speech that's unprotected harassment in the educational context. Most of the law in this area arose in the employment context. And yet we know from the employment context that there's situations where speech is unprotected because it is harassment. Think of the easiest example. The employer who says to an employee, sleep with me or you're fired, and the employee sues for sexual harassment. The employer would not have a defense any court by saying, well, it was just words, it was just speech. That's unprotected speech. The courts have also said in the employment context that speech can create a hostile and intimidating environment that itself violates anti-discrimination law. The Office of Civil Rights, the Department of Education, under Title VI and Title IX of the Civil Rights Laws, have tried to apply this context, concept of harassment to the context of colleges and universities. And generally, what courts and commentators have said is that in order to be harassment, it has to be directed at a person, or at least pervasive, and it has to materially interfere with educational opportunity on the basis of race or sex or religion or sexual orientation. But to articulate that standard to you doesn't provide much guidance for campus officials or courts of when does speech cross the line from the permissible to the impermissible harassing. Let me contrast two examples. There was an incident at the University of California, San Diego where somebody put over a tree branch something that looked to be a noose. This is a vile symbol that brings to mind lynchings. And yet, in that context, it's not harassment. But imagine that somebody tacked to a dormitory door, say an African-American student, that same thing that looked like a noose. That would be harassment. That would not be speech protected by the First Amendment. But here, too, we're in an area where the law simply hasn't kept up, and it hasn't provided enough of a definition of when is speech impermissible harassment in the context of college or university. Now, I've mentioned to you several categories of unprotected speech, child pornography, false and deceptive advertising, incitement, true threats, harassment. But notice what I did not include in this list, hate speech. The United States Supreme Court has been clear that hate speech is speech protected by the First Amendment. And the law in this area is well established. To pick an example, many in this room probably remember in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the Nazi party wanted to hold a march through Skokie, Illinois. Skokie is a suburb just north of Chicago. At the time this occurred, it was a predominantly Jewish suburb and had a large number of Holocaust survivors. Skokie tried hard to keep the Nazis from being able to march there. It said that it was afraid of a violent response against them by the audience. It said it was concerned about the tremendous costs. It was worried about the great infliction of emotional distress, especially on the Holocaust survivors. Every court to rule, including the United States Supreme Court, said that the Nazis had the right to march. The fact that it was hateful speech wasn't a sufficient basis for punishing it. Well, you might remember a Supreme Court case from 1992, RAV versus City of St. Paul. St. Paul, Minnesota adopted an ordinance 
prohibiting burning a cross or painting a swastika in a manner likely to anger, alarm, or cause resentment. The United States Supreme Court unanimously declared that law unconstitutional. Once more, the court reaffirmed hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. Or a case coming from here in Virginia, Virginia versus Black in 2003. Virginia had a law that essentially prohibited cross burning. It did so based on the vile history of this in this state and throughout the South. Two cases came before the Supreme Court under the statute. One involved members of the Klan who burned a cross on an isolated farm where there were few onlookers. The other involved the prosecution of some men who burned a cross on the lawn of a home recently purchased by an African-American family. The Supreme Court held eight to one in an opinion by Justice Sandra O'Connor that the state of Virginia cannot prohibit all cross burning. The court didn't minimize the harm of cross burning, but it said hate speech is speech protected by the First Amendment. The court said the government can prohibit this if it amounts to what I told you about earlier, a true threat. The court said the members of the Klan couldn't be punished since there were few onlookers, not a true threat. But the court said, obviously, the men who burned the cross on the lawn of the home purchased by the African-American family punished because a true threat existed there. Why is it that courts have said that hate speech is protected by the First Amendment? As I've talked about free speech on campus, I've so often asked by people, what's the line between hate speech and free speech? I have to answer, hate speech under current law is a form of free speech. Why is it? Many scholars have eloquently written about the harms of hate speech. Professor Charles Lawrence of the University of Hawaii, Professor Mari Matsuda, uh, Professor Catherine McKinnon have all described in great detail the tremendous harms that hate speech inflicts on the audience. And when I saw the picture of the swastika yesterday on the halls of my law school, I suffered the reactions they described. I was sickened by it. I was angry over it. I was horrified by it. And yet, the courts have rejected the arguments of these scholars that hate speech regarded as unprotected speech. I think there's several explanations, and we could have a discussion about whether the courts have gotten it right or wrong. One concern is the impossibility of defining what's hate speech in a manner that's not unduly vague or overbroad. In the early 1990s, over 350 colleges and universities adopted so-called hate speech codes. Every single one to be challenged in a court was declared unconstitutional. Almost always these codes were declared unconstitutional on vagueness and overbreath grounds. As an example, after a series of very ugly racist incidents, the University of Michigan adopted a hate speech code. It prohibited speech that stigmatized or degraded on the basis of race, sex, or religion. What speech that stigmatizes or degrades the challenger in the case, Federal District Court, was a graduate student in sociobiology who said he was doing research on whether there were inherent differences between men and women. He said he worried that depending on his research findings, it might be seen as a stigmatizing or degrading. Any regulation of speech has to be clear about what's prohibited and what's allowed. It can't be overbroad. And the court said that language is impermissibly overbroad. Most European countries have laws that prohibit hate speech. If you look at those, and Chancellor Gill and I quote them in our book, you find they use language very similar to the hate speech codes in the United States. And it's language that wouldn't meet the test for vagueness and overbreath under the First Amendment. I think there's another concern that explains why the Supreme Court has found hate speech to be protected speech. And that's the laws of this sort are often used against the very people who they're meant to protect. When England adopted its first hate speech law, the initial prosecution under it was brought against a Zionist group. 
The prosecutor said that he believed under the United Nations resolution, Zionism was a form of racism. France has a hate speech law, and I bet you'd be surprised if I tell you who's one of the people most frequently prosecuted under it, the actress Bridget Bardot, because her speech for animal activism has run afoul of France's hate speech law. Or maybe most powerfully, to again go back to the University of Michigan example, when the Michigan hate speech code was on the book, every attempt to enforce it, without exception, was against African American and Latino students. I think most of all, though, the reason the Supreme Court has said that hate speech is speech protected by the First Amendment is that it expresses an idea. It may be an idea that we abhor, but it's still an idea. Just as John Marshall Harlan said in Cone versus California, that to censor words is to censor ideas. We can't cleanse the English language to please the most squeamish among us. Well, this then brings me to the third and final point I make in describing current law, and that's that there can be time, place, and manner restrictions, so long as they leave open adequate alternative places for communication. This is a well-established concept. Even though there's a right to use government property for speech, it doesn't mean that there's a right to use any property at any time for speech in any manner. There's a right to use public streets for speech, but it doesn't mean there's a right to use the middle of a freeway in rush hour for expressive activity. Colleges and universities can use time, place, and manner restrictions so as to prevent disruption of school activities and so as to protect safety. There is a First Amendment right to speak on campus, but there's not a First Amendment right to come into my classroom and shout me down. There's not a First Amendment right to go into the Supreme Court's chambers and yell so the justices and lawyers can't be heard. Well, likewise, a college university can make sure that speech activities aren't going on in or near classroom buildings when they're in session, and college universities can designate so-called free speech areas so long as they leave adequate alternative places for communication. Also, it's clear that college and universities can use these time, place, and manner restrictions so as to ensure safety. Campuses have the duty, legally, ethically, to make sure that students, staff, and faculty are safe. One way to do this is regulating where and when speech occurs. My advice to the Chancellor and Provost at the University of California, Berkeley, was that particularly controversial speakers have them speak in an auditorium rather than in the middle of campus. If it's an auditorium, you can make sure that people have tickets. You can have metal detectors to make sure weapons are not brought in. The police can secure the perimeter. It's very hard to do that with an open area of campus. And I think having a speaker be in an auditorium rather than out in the open is the epitome of a permissible time, place, and manner restriction. One of the hard questions is, how much must a campus pay so as to ensure speech while also protecting safety? I recognize that there may be a point at which a campus has to say, we can't allow this speaker and be able to protect public safety. Then the campus has no choice but to cancel the speaker. But that should be a last resort. It should never be a viewpoint. But at what point can a campus say, we just can't afford to provide the protection anymore. My chancellor, Carol Christ, asked me this question at the beginning of September. And I said, there's no Supreme Court case on point. There's some lower court cases. The most you can infer from them is you have to spend a reasonable amount of money so as to ensure the speaker and protect safety. Now, we as lawyers, as law students, are used to Reasonable is a concept in the law. For an English professor whose chancellor wants to do the right thing, saying you have to do what's reasonable doesn't provide nearly enough guidance. Could the campus say, we'll spend $2 million this year, but no more than that? What would be where the line is drawn? I don't know how to answer the question. Now, I'll tell you what I said to the chancellor. I said, I'm not here as your lawyer. You have campus counsel for that. But if I were your lawyer, I would ask you to think about two questions. First, what is your stomach for litigation? 
How willing are you to be sued, knowing that if you lose, you have to pay attorney's fees and maybe damages? And second, what do you want your public relations message to be? And she thought it very important that the public relations message be, at this moment in time, that Berkeley is open for speech. The lower court cases, as I said, don't give much guidance. They say, if there's going to be a fee for speaking, it can't be that the government officials have discretion in setting the amount of the fee, because that could lead to viewpoint discrimination. They say the amount of the fee can't be so large as to keep the speaker from being able to appear. The campus couldn't say to Ben Shapiro or the college Republicans, he can speak, but only if he pays $600,000 to do so. Skokie tried that with an insurance bond, and it was declared invalid. But here, too, as I'm identifying for you areas where the law is just unsettled, where there's real work that needs to be done, this is a key question, and it's quite real on my campus and many others. So those are the basic principles with regard to freedom of speech. Um, let me conclude by applying them to some of the issues that are now very much in the news. The use of speech for disruption, safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions, the internet. These two, I think, are the cutting edge issues where the law has not kept up yet with the circumstances. Let me talk about speech in terms of disruption. Last Friday at the University of Oregon, President Michael Schill was going to deliver a speech on the state of the university. A group of students stood up and yelled so that he could not be heard. His speech never took place. But two weeks ago, at William and Mary Law School, an ACLU lawyer was going to speak, and a group of students shouted so that she could not be heard. Several years ago, at the University of California, Irvine, Ambassador Michael Oren from Israel was going to speak, and a group of 11 students, in turn, stood up and shouted so he could not be heard. In all of these instances, the defense of those who were engaged in disruption was, we were just using speech. We have freedom of speech, too. Here, though, I think the law is clearly settled. There's no right to use speech to silence somebody who's been invited by the campus or others to engage in speech. That those who shouted down Michael Scholler, the ACLU lawyer, Ambassador Oren, have no defense to university discipline or it comes to that criminal prosecution by just saying they're engaged in speech. And I think the explanation for this should be easy. Otherwise, it would be possible to always silence a speaker just by having an audience shout the person down. Then the reaction of the audience always could prevent the speech then there always would be a heckler's veto. A second thing I want to talk about in applying my principles for you is this concept of safe spaces. Safe spaces is much discussed positively and negatively in the blogs, in the conversation about speech. My problem is that I think that the phrase safe spaces might mean many different things. Let me identify four different meanings, some of which I think are quite laudable some unacceptable. One thing that safe spaces might mean is the duty of the college or university to protect the safety of students, staff, and faculty. I think in that sense, of course, campuses must be a safe space. They have the duty to protect physical safety. Another thing that safe spaces might mean is the importance of a place of repose. We all need a place we can go to for repose. I think of dormitories being that for students. I think campuses can impose much greater restrictions on speech in dormitories, so long as it's viewpoint neutral. I favor campuses creating things like black students' unions, women's students' unions, try to historically exclude groups, a place of repose. A third thing that safe spaces might mean is about the classroom. As a professor, I want every class I teach to be felt by my students as a safe space. I want all my students to feel comfortable expressing all ideas and viewpoints, knowing that they'll be treated respectfully and will respond with dialogue. But there's a final meaning of safe spaces, and this is the one that you sometimes see and that I reject, and that's that colleges and universities, having a duty to create safe spaces, must protect students from ideas or views that they'll find offensive and upset to them.
And I've heard, including on my campus, students say, I feel threatened by this idea being expressed. I need the campus to be a safe space where this isn't going to be here. Safe spaces can't mean that. The nature, I think, of a college or university is that students are going to be expressed to ideas that may be unsettling, setting, even deeply offensive. And it cannot be that the desire to protect students from that will be what we do by creating safe spaces. Another concept that's much discussed is so-called trigger warnings. Trigger warnings where a professor warns the students in advance that certain material might be upsetting. I've given trigger warnings to the professor long before I knew that phrase. When Howard Gilman and I read to our students the exact <coughs> language of the chant from the bus at the University of Oklahoma, we told our students that it was deeply offensive, it spoke of lynching in a positive manner, it was very racist. I, when I teach First Amendment law, I always played to my students the George Carlin monologue on the seven dirty words. The only way to understand the Supreme Court decision in FCC for Specifica, which is about that monologue, is to, for the students to hear it. But I've always warned the students that I'm going to play them a monologue that's filled with profanities, has a lot of sexual references, and I always say, if you think it's going to bother you, it's going to take five minutes, you're welcome to leave. I've never had a student leave and not listen, but I certainly give them that option. I've given them a trigger warning. My objection to trigger warnings is if a college or university were to require that professors administer them. There's a proposal at Oberlin College and a, professor, a proposal at the University of California, Santa Barbara, to require that professors give trigger warnings. That, to me, is an infringement of academic freedom. A professor has to decide what's the best way to cover particular material for students. And I respect professors who think, in instance, trigger warnings might be useful, and in instance, we think they wouldn't be useful. The fourth of the concepts that I mentioned to you was microaggressions. That, too, is a phrase now much in vogue. A microaggression is a slight, often unintentional, on the basis of characteristics like race, or sex, or religion, or sexual orientation. And I believe that microaggressions can cause great harm to people, great psychic distress. And I encourage colleges and universities to educate their students what others might feel are microaggressions. Orientation for students is a place where this might occur. Now, we're I would be upset is if colleges and universities decided they're going to punish the speech that's microaggressions. I don't think that's an appropriate response. Though even when I've said that college universities should educate students not to engage in microaggressions, one of the responses I've gotten is, well, you're just instituting political correctness. And I strongly disagree. We all learn from a young age there's certain things we don't say in public, certain things we don't politely say to other people. There's nothing wrong with educating those students about what others might find to be a microaggression. Finally, I find some of the hardest issues with regard to free speech concerning the internet, and this too is a place where the law has simply not kept up. I think that the internet is the most powerful tool for speech since the development of the printing press. It has tremendously democratized access to a mass audience. It used to be to reach a mass audience, you had to be rich enough to own a newspaper or get a broadcast license. Now, anybody who's got a smartphone, we have access to a modem in a library, can reach a mass audience. But that also carries with it the ability to disclose to a mass audience very private information about other individuals, so-called doxing. It means the ability to circulate to a mass audience false information about somebody. There used to be a line between what went on on campus and off campus. The internet makes that line irrelevant. The internet can be used through tools like Yik Yak to harass individuals. And we know that often the harassment is directed at women, at students of color, who historically have been discriminated against. When can a school punish speech over the <coughs> internet? Where is the line to be drawn in that regard? We just haven't kept up. So this is the landscape for talking about free speech on campus. I want to make clear that I believe that college and university administrators have the duty to create an inclusive learning environment for all students, consistent with these principles. 
campus administrators have the obligation to use their power of free speech. At 8 o'clock this morning, Pacific time, I sent an email to all students, staff, and faculty at the University of California Berkeley School of Law condemning the hate speech that occurred yesterday, saying that I hope that everyone in our community believed it was inconsistent with the type of community that we are and that we aspire to be. And I think that was an important use of my free speech in affirming what we are as a community. I realize that what I've said is controversial. I realize the impulse to want to stop the speech that we find to be distasteful, let alone hateful. But I also believe that above all, the First Amendment exists to protect the speech that we hate. We don't need the First Amendment to protect the speech we like. We would naturally let that go anyway. We need freedom of speech to protect the speech we detest. The only way that our speech can be protected tomorrow is that we protect the speech that we don't like of others today. Is it possible that allowing free speech, especially hate speech, could lead to catastrophe? Is it possible there could be a rise of white supremacy or Nazism in this country? History shows it's possible. But I believe that the First Amendment and all the Constitution is based on a faith. A faith that if we allow all ideas to be expressed, that won't happen. And if we were to try to stop the speech, it wouldn't prevent it from happening. It's a faith that we're all better off with the unfettered free exchange of ideas, better off than we'd be with government censorship. Thank you so much. Sure. I'm delighted to. Thank you. I'm glad to take questions. I'm also glad if you want to make a comment and disagree with me. Please. Oh, you're very kind. I've thank heard, you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I've heard from friends of mine uh, about um, educators at different colleges across the country, particularly professors of, say, a literature class or maybe a film class in which the material may, in some cases, contain um, something that might uh, trigger a particular student. Maybe it's a description of rape in a novel or, or uh, you know, uh, racially insensitive language. Um, and that the professor has uh, essentially said, well, uh, if, if you can't, if this is something that's going to trigger you, you need not come to class this day and we're going to find some supplemental material, right? And this is, uh, to, to people I know, this is concerning to them, right? That there's now a sort of disequilibrium between what one student in one class is learning and what another student in that same class is learning. And I was just curious as to sort of what your perspective on that is as an educator. I leave it up to the professor. I believe in academic freedom. I, as a professor, have often given my students options in terms of evaluation. I've had classes where I say, you can do three short papers or one long paper or an exam. Um, I've taught seminars where they get to choose from a menu of options in terms of what weight to give which things are the grades. And if a professor says, I'm willing to cover this material for these students, but not and let other students opt on other material, I respect the professor's ability to choose that. Um, obviously, my hope would be that the professor would make the burden on all students equal in terms of workload. And I think in all schools, professors have to announce in advance what the students are going to be evaluated on and can't change that down the road. Um, I would never want a college or university to mandate that professors do that, but I respect the choice of my colleagues if they think that that's a better way of covering the material. I don't think I would make that choice. I think that um, we have to deal with some really terrible parts of American and world history in studying constitutional law. I, if I taught criminal law, I would teach rape because that is a part of the criminal law, even though I know that some of the people in that classroom have been raped and it's a very difficult subject for them. But if I had a colleague who said, no, I don't want to do that because whatever reasons, I respect his or her choice. Thank you. So you didn't touch on school groups and their membership and sure. 
a group able to define its message based on its membership. So I'm thinking Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. Um, do you ever see speech groups or groups on campus being able to define their membership in the same way that they are in the public at large? Boy Scouts of America be Dale, those kind of things. Uh, here the distinction that I drew that everyone in this room knows between public universities and private universities is quite important. At my law school now, UCI before, um, we had a rule that said any officially recognized student group has to be open to all comers. Being an officially recognized student group means that you're entitled to receive student activity money, you can reserve classrooms. And our idea is that if we're going to be taking money from some students to then give to the student groups, all students should be able to be part of those student groups. And I favor an all-comers policy, at least in the context of a public university. Christian Legal Society versus Martinez, the case that you mentioned, involved the University of California Hastings College of Law in it having an all-comers policy. And the Supreme Court, five to four, in an opinion by Justice Ginsburg, upheld it as constitutional. I agree with that result. Now, a group can exist without being an officially recognized student group. Um, students can have whatever groups they want. And the only thing is that they don't get student activity fees and they can't use school facilities. And that's because I don't want to have meetings in my school that, using school resources that some students are excluded for, especially in that case on the basis of their religious beliefs, let alone on the basis of race or sex or sexual orientation, which is also at stake in that case. Now, a private university doesn't have to make that choice. Um, a private university doesn't have to have an all-comers policy. I would still favor one if I were at a private university. And I spent most of my career at private universities because I really believe if you're going to be using money from students, no student should be able to be excluded. Hey, I was curious. I was wondering, how do you feel about protesting with weapons and torches? Is there a line that you can cross that it no longer should be protected? There is no constitutional right to bring a weapon to a demonstration. People do not bring weapons with them to engage in dialogue. We could talk all we want about the Second Amendment, but all the Supreme Court has said is the Second Amendment means you have a right to have a gun in your home for the sake of security. No court has ever said there's a Second Amendment right to bring a gun or any weapon to a march or a demonstration. And so I think it's completely appropriate, say, at the University of California, Berkeley, that people, when they go in to hear a controversial speaker, have to go through a metal detector to make sure they're not bringing a weapon in. Um, so uh, as a matter of constitutional law, I think the answer is absolutely clear. The government can prohibit weapons. I think as a matter of common sense, the government should prohibit weapons. Um, so earlier in your uh, lecture, you talked about how you would never experience seeing, um, for example, a swastika at your school, um, which to me indicates a, a shift in the generally accepted social norms. Um, so my question is, do you think that the authors of the Constitution and, and also the authors of specifically the, the First Amendment had in mind that there were generally accepted social norms and that those norms would be maintained over time. And if you don't think that, do you think that should be included? Um, it's a great question. I don't think we will ever know what the drafters of the First Amendment thought about this or the other issues we're facing. There was a Supreme Court case several years ago, Entertainment Merchants versus Brown, that involved a California law that made it a crime to sell or rent a violent videotape to a minor under 18 without parental consent. And Justice Scalia was asking questions just like this about what did the framers of the First Amendment think. And finally, Justice Alito came in and said, what Justice Alito, Scalia really wants to know is, what did James Madison think about violent video games? <laughs> it's such a different world today than existed in 1787. It's why I reject the idea of originalism. It's, it's got to be a living constitution. After all, their constitution was written basically for white male property owners. African Americans not only didn't have any rights, they could be enslaved, 
and they were counted even for voting as three-fifths of a person. Women didn't get the right to vote until 1920. So how do you talk about the meaning of hate speech in the context of 1791 in a slave society? That's why I think what we have to do is be making the choices today. Okay. Right here. Uh, thank you so much for your time. There's been a lot of call for equal time for ideas being exchanged, um, as well as equal opportunity for both uh, in news and media, but also a lot of students are saying that their professors are biased to either the left or the right or the center, and they want an equal time given in the classroom for all ideas. Uh, what, if any, duty do you think professors have for giving a sort of equal time for all ideas uh, and also at the world at large? Thank you. Professors have to decide the best way to teach their classes. Some professors think pedagogically express to express their views. Some professors believe it's much better to try to be neutral. My own approach in my classroom is I want my classroom to be a forum where all ideas are expressed. And I find that if there's no one taking a particular position, say the conservative position, I will then be the one to voice it. And I try very hard in my classroom to, to be neutral. There are certain places where I'm not neutral and I wouldn't pretend to be. Um, but overall, that's what I aspire to. And I'm proud that in all of the years I've been a law professor, I've never had a teaching evaluation that criticized me for being too liberal, though I'm obviously an outspoken liberal. Um, that's my choice in terms of how to conduct my classroom, but I respect the choice of somebody else. I would hope that any professor would always encourage students of all views to express those views, whether the professor is being neutral or not. Um, my concern is that if I'm taking a strong position, it might chill speech, but again, I respect the ability of everybody to teach the class the way he or she thinks is best. There's no one pedagogy that's the ideal way. In terms of equal time, let me go back a little bit. The, the Supreme Court case back in 1969, Red Lion Broadcasting versus Federal Communication Commission, that involved a law that existed then, the Fairness Doctrine, and whether the government could require things like equal time. And the Supreme Court upheld this saying that the broadcast media is inherently scarce, and because of the scarcity of the broadcast media, it's appropriate to impose this. And then in another case, Miami Herald versus Tornillo, the Supreme Court came to the opposite conclusion as the newspapers. What's changed since 1969 is no longer is there a scarcity of media. Now there's the ability of people to have infinite websites to visit of all viewpoints and the ability of people to express themselves to a mass audience, as I said. If people want equal time, they can find it. They can express the viewpoint. So I think the underlying premise of Red Lion that justified the fairness doctrine, scarcity of the broadcast media, is just no longer true. Thank you so much for having me.